So if you could be here around nine, that would be great. Okay. Well, listen here. Hello, and welcome to 90 Day Fiance MK Classic Edition. I'm Mr. O, and today, Miss H and I will be discussing Season 1, Episodes 3 and 4 of Happily Ever After. In this episode, Lauren and Alexi get to Israel, Pal and Muhammad both get to Miami, although they get there separately, Melanie and Devar get to Jamaica, and Brett and Daya get to their wildly over-budget new home. And as always, we'll have our Students of the Week, class dances, and life lessons. We'll be back again on Monday to discuss the new episode of Before the 90 Days, and then we'll be back again next week to cover episodes 5 and 6 of this show. Okay, stay tuned and enjoy. Hello, Mr. O. Hello, Miss H. I almost choked myself because I have different headphones today. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> well, I'm happy you are alive so we can live to uh, have another podcast on this uh, train wreck of a show, 90 Day Fiance, uh, Happily Ever After. Yeah, some of them are train wrecking. Some of them are slowly getting there. Some yes, of them are trying to I- uh, just pull it out of the station. Danielle Muhammad, like, I don't remember the details of this, uh, even though this is my second time through. And I'm just like, wow, wow. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But um, why don't you go ahead and start with one of yours? Okay, so let's go ahead and start with uh, Lauren and Alexi. So Lauren continues to believe that she needs to prove that she is the perfect wife on this trip to Israel. It's Alex's first trip back to Israel since he's moved to the States. Lauren plans on opening up about her threats to Alexi's family and friends. And Lauren is getting suspicious about Alex's five pants, five shirts packing business, thinking he is going to move there and ignores her own three suitcases for two weeks. Alexi, Lauren, and Lauren's parents arrive in Israel, and Alex is driving them around as he chugs a Red Bull. Lauren is getting more and more nervous, which sets off her ticking. The two families meet as Alex acts as the translator. They are all sleeping at Alex's parents' house and keep the conversation brief as everyone is tired from the long trip. Okay, so, Mr. O, what do you usually pack for a two-week trip? A two-week trip? It depends on where it is, but I'm definitely... Definitely can fit it into a um, overhead carry on bag. Oh, carry on. That's it. I can definitely yeah. fit it into a carry on. Okay, so five shirts, five pants. That's reasonable, right? Five shirts, five pants. Yeah, I can fit five shirts and five pants into a kit because it's not even like shirt. He was wearing tank tops the whole time, so it's like small, right. tiny shirts, little and shorts. That's so right? true. Like when, I, yeah. When I travel to foreign places that are like gonna be warm, like all my clothes fit in a carry on for like two weeks as well. And it's because, and I'll have something different. Like I have much more than five shirts, five pants, but my clothes are little when it gets to like tank tops and shorts. So fits a lot more. I mean, I tend to usually have more shirts and pants because I rewear the pants, but yeah. But like, yeah, five, especially because he's gonna have access to a uh, laundry. So sure. Yeah. Okay. So. How would that look compared to if you were going to move somewhere temporarily? What would you pack if you were going to move somewhere temporarily? If I plan on moving it, I would have to put almost my whole dresser in there, right? I have to have different shorts. I'd have to have coats, you know, jackets, my sweaters, oh, like, gosh. You know, sweat hoodies, yeah. like all this other different stuff that would have to go there. It would definitely not be the same thing. Right. I was so confused why she was all of a sudden worried, like, oh, my gosh, he's packing a lot. He's trying to, like, move there. It's like, he just said he's bringing five of each. Th- I don't think you're trying to move somewhere. Literally not even a week's worth of clothes. No. So, I don't know. I thought that was. It, it's especially, you're right, you mentioned it. It was especially funny compared to her being like, ooh, I need a third suitcase. I don't know. Have you ever done that thing? It's not my style. But I've definitely known people who like travel with an empty suitcase just because they know they're going to have to lug back all the stuff that they buy when they're there. (laughs) I do have a friend, uh, my friend that uh, lived in Japan um, because he was so much taller than, um, you know, typical Japanese person. Whenever Uh he would come home to visit for the holidays, he would always come with an empty suitcase because he would go clothes shopping because he could never find clothes in Japan. Okay. So he's the only one that I know of that's ever done that. But I certainly have friends that overpack. 
like yes. Lauren style, like gigantic suitcases for just a weekend. And you're just right. like, why? And they're like, well, I need different outfits, like different outfit choices, especially if we go to Vegas, then forget it. Yeah, no, I don't care. I don't care. I'm like, I, no. I, I'm like, maybe I'll buy a backup. Yeah. Right. But I, I can't imagine. Like, I've always been a light packer, too. Okay. Even if you're going to Vegas for the weekend and you want to wear something different every night, right? You're talking at most like, Two nights. Fine outfits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two because nights. you want to wear something in the day, something at night, maybe some workout clothes. If you really need to go running that bad that you can't go a weekend without getting exercise in. Like, and you're still talking about like five. It still fits in a carry on. So, but with the, what people yeah. run into is they run into the issue. Well, two issues. One issue is they they can't make up their mind what they want to wear, so they just pack everything yes. so they can make up their mind there. Is one issue. The second issue is shoes. If you want to wear those big, like knee high boots, like they take up a lot of room in a suitcase. Oh gosh. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say maybe that's why I don't have as much of a problem. I'm pretty decisive and I'm also one of those people that, you know, if I pack for something and I wear it, I'm never like, oh, I'm so unhappy with what I'm like wearing now. It's like, well, if I own it, I probably like it enough to wear it out and about. Yeah, I should have picked my silver shirt instead of my, oh, this one sucks. My black shirt. Oh, I'm terrible. like, oh, I, I can't even, I can't even go in public with this shirt on. It's like, well, then why do you own it? <laughs> exactly. And if you did own it, why did you bring it? It doesn't make sense. Okay. Yeah, so there's a lot of things, but I mean, if I'm packing a really huge suitcase, it's likely because I'm packing things in it. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, there are sometimes I pack some really bizarre things for like races and stuff, which include like multiple parts of costumes. And oh, okay. I also sure. pack, um, I've been stopped in security before because I've packed one of those like uh, um, electric uh, air compressor massage thingies. You like stick your legs into these like leg sleeves and it like it's I'm there's an you. electric pump to it. And so I've been stopped because they just what is this? This electronic what hydraulic this? thing <laughs> in here. This, this needs, we need to examine this. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, same thing when I get like I have like video game systems and stuff that mm -hmm. I'll throw into a suitcase. I mean, that can take up some room. All right. But back yeah. to the show, actually. I really appreciated. <laughs> sure. uh, I really liked Alexi driving everybody around. He seemed I don't know. It's it's chill he yeah i mean he's a pretty chill guy all the time yeah, but he, he seemed is. extra chill being back in israel yeah i think he felt comfortable mm -hmm. uh with his surroundings i think he was really happy to be back i thought it was hilarious that he was just he was like that weird uber driver that's like chugging red bull and like leaning back <laughs> like oh you're also, here also pointing out everything to you yeah <laughs> like, oh, that's what they used to have a walmart for they move over here yeah yeah, yeah. We've been in town long. <laughs> like, yo, dude, lay back on the Red Bull Uber driver. Definitely. So just last quick note I have on them is I don't understand why she feels in need and putting all this pressure on herself to prove that she is the perfect wife. And it seems like she's justifying that by saying like, well, he moved away and made all these sacrifices for me. So I must be perfect. It's like no one's perfect. I don't no think one's anyone's perfect. expecting you to be. Exactly. Like she's setting up, I must be the perfect wife is like way too high a standard for anybody to set to. And I don't know, it kind right. of puts all this, it does, it puts all this unnecessary pressure on you. That is like, why? Yeah. Like, I don't think there's anybody who thinks she's a bad wife or that she, you know, he shouldn't right. have Right. I feel like the whatever. bar is like, low. That's, well, that's a lower bar. Yeah, the bar is low. Just don't do anything terrible. Yeah. Right. Don't be like other people in this show and you'll be fine. Right. Like, Speaking of other people, other on people show. <laughs> like Danielle and Muhammad. Oh, All right. goodness. So they didn't share any scenes together. So I think it makes the most sense to recap them one at a time. So I'm going to start with okay, Muhammad sure. because that's where the show starts. Uh, yeah. He is at a train station at 4 a.m. in South Carolina. Louisa meets him there and they hop into the car to drive the rest of the way to Miami. They're clearly like really into each other, but neither one wants to admit it to the cameras. They keep playing this. We're just friends line. Eventually, they get to Miami, where the hotel room only has one bed. Uh, and they have jokingly, they have a half-joking conversation about who is going to sleep on the floor, because Muhammad mind, sharing a hotel room doesn't hurt you in the pending divorce if you sleep on the floor. <laughs> Muhammad wants to hit the ground running and wants to find a job and get a place to stay, a permanent place to stay, I should say, the next day. We find out later that Louisa isn't really as enthusiastic about this stuff as Muhammad is. 
But the next day, they go to South Beach and decide to sit on the dunes really, really far away from the ocean to have a conversation. (laughs) Honestly, at this point, I'm already getting tired of Muhammad because he just keeps expressing the same things over and over and over again. He just wants to trust females again and not be held back by someone else. Then he and Louisa play grab ass on the beach and he almost shows a little bit of personality. (laughs) <laughs> then we get back to the hotel room and Muhammad is nagging Louisa about texting her friends about getting him a job. She doesn't like that he keeps trying to have the same conversations and he doesn't like that he's completely dependent on somebody else again. They start to have a dumb little fight, but both just get mad at each other. Uh, and then Muhammad walks out and leaves and Louisa's like, and, and Louisa says they'll be fighting about that for the next five hours. The next day, they go to a hookah bar and continue their dumb bickering. The biggest revelation that comes out of this is that Louisa is already getting tired of Muhammad and Mike is thinking about moving to the West Coast. All right, so now to Danielle. We start with her turn at the lawyer. Um, The lawyer listens to her soul story and presents Danielle with two options. Option one is divorce, which would be pretty easy. Um, It would only take six weeks or so, but it would allow Muhammad to stay in the country. Option two is to go for an annulment, which requires that Danielle prove fraud, so it's a much higher bar and it's going to be much harder to accomplish. But if she chooses annulment, she might be able to get Muhammad out of the country. The lawyer says that she has a good case for fraud if Muhammad has truly moved to Miami with another woman. Danielle chooses the annulment option because she doesn't think Muhammad deserves to stay in the country and she wants him gone. Soon... Danielle learns that Muhammad has, in fact, moved to Florida with Louisa, and she tells Big Beth about it. Beth has some choice words about Muhammad and urges Danielle to keep going through with the annulment, but it turns out that's harder than it sounds. Since Muhammad does not have a permanent address, they're having difficulty serving him the papers, and if they can't serve him the papers, the case might get thrown out. We also learn here that Danielle is talking to another man that should be well out of her league, and his name is Gabe. Danielle goes out for a date with Gabe at the roller skating rink. Danielle is super annoying the entire time. She can't skate without hanging all over the wall. And oh she talk, can't talk to or about Gabe without giggling like a little girl. So we get some answers to the questions we were thinking. Because then they talk to Gabe. What's wrong with Gabe? What does he see in Danielle? Why is he here? He tells us that he's always had a thing for heavy set women. And he prefers older women because they know what they want. So, I mean, I guess that's something, but I still don't get it. Even among over, older, older, w- overweight women, he could still do better than Danielle. Yeah. But I will ask you the question. That's the end of their segment. I will ask you the question that Muhammad asks rhetorically to the camera. So, does Muhammad make women crazy or does he just attract crazy? Or are they not crazy I- at all? I think that he definitely attracts crazy. And I think he is a little bit naive, you know, Mm -hmm. like uh, Louisa is terrible. When I was watching this, I was so infuriated with her. And I think towards the end, I realized it wasn't necessarily her, but it's who she represents, you know, and like that kind of person just annoys me. Like, mm-hmm. the person who just kind of flits around, like, has no real plan in life. They're like, they'll try this. If it doesn't work out, whatever. And it's like, that's fine if it's just you. But it's not you anymore. It's you and somebody <laughs> else. And I think it's just right. so inconsiderate and, like, rude of you to drag someone into this and be like, well, you know, everybody just takes care of themselves. So you figure out your own shit. Like, I'm going to go over here. It's like, yes, but that sucks. You've just abandoned someone and they don't necessarily have a plan in place and they don't have the same rights and freedoms that you do. And so it's going to be more difficult for them. Like, what are you doing? And it's like, she's just a terrible person. And I don't think Muhammad made her a terrible person. But at the same time, it's like, you should be, I mean, if I were Muhammad, I would have been super suspicious of this person to begin with. Like, she doesn't even know you. And she like wants to move to another state with you, having never met you before. It's like, well, Muhammad, like, (laughs) yes, it sucks what happened to you. But 
I also, from his perspective, I would have been suspicious and I wouldn't have been all that surprised if that happened to me. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking the same thing. Like the kind of person that will up and move to Florida with a random Facebook friend is the same person who will up and just go to the West Coast too. Like you can't be surprised if that happens. And abandoned said Facebook friend like in Florida. Right. So I'm just like, okay, yeah. Both of you are terrible people and in your own way. So I think, Muhammad, what your bigger issue, what your bigger issue, Muhammad, is that, you know, you pick wrong people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So it's not about whether he attracts crazy. He picked crazy. Yeah, he is attracted to crazy. The only kind of person he's going to be able to get on his side on the time scale that he wants to get them on his side are going to be crazy people. Yeah. Like he wants to spend no time That's developing true. any kind of relationship. I want to go to Florida now. What I need out of Ohio yes, right now. I need out. Right. That That's really true because I think Danielle brings up a good point. I mean, she tells, you know, the camera this several times, like every time we see her. Muhammad is a user, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it's like you got to think about if you're trying to target someone, if you're trying to use someone. You know, it's like, those aren't going to, if you're desperate, these are not quality people. And so I'm not saying he's innocent by any means. Like, he's not a victim in this, you know. He doesn't just happen across a crazy person and then, oh my God, you know, like this crazy person screwed me over. It's like, that's not exactly what's happening. Muhammad is trying to get something from these people. He is a user. And it just so happens that the people he's targeting, like, they don't have their shit together. Right, because those are the people that you can target easily. Right. No, exactly. That That is exactly it. Muhammad is only going to do what's good for Muhammad. That's all he's ever going to yes. do. Um, but, and that's yeah. what super annoys me about him is always act. he's always talking to us like he's the victim. And it's like, no, right. you went out of your way to do this. She's like, oh, I just don't know. I just want to do my thing and blah, blah, blah. Because, I mean, and he was, I do feel that he was dependent. And I did feel... For him in that moment when he was like, I thought you were going to text your friends. Mm-hmm. And she's like, when I say I'll do it, I'll do it. And he's like, but you haven't done it yet. <laughs> like, right. And she's like, well, I'll do it. And he's like, what's wrong with right now? Like, why are you not doing it? Yeah. I don't understand. Which is like dealing with a teenager all the time. Like, I'll do it later. It's like, why wait for later? Just do it now. I know. What's wrong with right at the moment? <laughs> what are you doing right now? Yeah, I thought Luisa was like really terrible and I did feel bad for him. But then as much as I was feeling sorry for him, it just took me a moment to be like, well, he is the one against attorney advice. Yeah. You know, like even though he's got a legal situation back in Ohio who chose to leave because he was so desperate to leave. And so it's like you can't expect to escape your problems and not have something else happen and it just so happens that in this particular situation that the issues he had is not a direct result of him running away from his problems right you know like this is just something that could i mean so you kind of are like oh that sucks for you but at the same time it's like yeah you know like same same you're gonna run into issues we we talked about the lawyer advice and i could not get over his uh, oh who's gonna sleep on the floor and by the way he said it half sarcastically but he really wanted louisa to sleep on the floor like, he was like, you should sleep on the yeah, floor. And no, she was absolutely. like, ha ha, that's a good joke. And he was like, nope, I'm not kidding. You should sleep on the floor. <laughs> but, that's weird. Because I would think in his culture, like, I don't know. Is it? Is it, do you think it's a cultural thing? Like, men should get, like, the best of everything? Possibly. Or do you think, I would think culturally it would be more so like, well, you know, men take care of the women. So shouldn't you? Isn't it like the chivalrous yeah, I, I, thing for you, you know, to we've do? Heard, we've heard kind of both kind of cultural things, but I, I could totally see, not that I know at, at, at that this is true at all, but I could see him mm-hmm. kind of pulling that card. No, no, no. In my culture, the man is the man of the king of the castle and the king of the castle gets the bed. Yeah. Like, you know, but I don't know. I just, it was, I, I couldn't get over his, his logic of like, they're going to go to court and they're going to be like, so the court records set showed that while you were still married, you went and shared a hotel room with this <laughs> other woman. And he's going to be like, ah, ha, ha, but, but, but I slept on the floor. <laughs> like, the judge is going to be like, oh, well, this is new information. You slept on the floor. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think he was concerned that it's being filmed. Yeah. I mean, it, was there because I'm pretty sure that's pe- some things people try. It's like, oh, yes, I did meet that woman in the hotel room, but we didn't have sex. So it wasn't infidelity. And they're like, yeah, we don't care. 
that right that, the bar is set you you that's uh, that's infidelity if you're trying to prove it not that you usually have to anymore yeah. and that's that was the th- point for danielle is if she just wanted a divorce there's no fault to forces you don't have to prove anybody did anything you can just say i don't want to be married anymore and he can say i don't want to be married anymore either and then especially them because they don't really have much together you know you shake hands and that's it it's done whereas if the annulment now you have to prove things right and now you have to prove there was infidelity and if, we, if there was infidelity so close to the date of the wedding that it was like he never intended on staying faithful at all that's where your fraud would come from but ugh, that just sounds terrible like that's a whole yeah. ordeal to I go mean, through i feel like it was just because the cameras were there you know and mm-hmm. he almost wanted like video evidence that nothing shady was happening because, right, because I felt like he, he said just it. seemed he really He said when awkward. they were talking about the floor, he was like, well, because, you know, the divorce thing, I can't be seen. We're like, yeah. too late. <laughs> it's too late for that. Right. You're moving to other, yeah, another state for this person. Okay, let's talk about Luisa a little bit more. Okay. I could not stand her. And like mm-hmm. I said, it was mostly because of the person she represents. It was like she was a composite figure of all the terrible people that I really cannot stand. Like, that just annoy me. She was on her phone all the time. Oh, and let me also say what one of my biggest pet peeves are. Biggest pet peeves. I hate it when people are constantly on their phone, but they are convinced that they can do two things at once. And I am thinking of a friend specifically Mm -hmm. where... All of our friends think the exact same thing about him. Oh, yeah. He is yeah. always on his phone and he is always talking to you while staring at his phone and doing the uh huh, uh huh, uh huh thing. And then you're like, uh, can you like listen to me? And he's like, I can listen to you and be on my phone. And he is convinced that right. he can do both. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, maybe you can kind of half listen and maybe you get right. the general idea. I'm not saying that you can't, but you're not doing it well and it's rude so rude it's like a whole other level because yeah they do that and they're like i can listen to you and you're like really because i just asked you what restaurant you wanted to go to and you said "Uh uh-huh because yeah and and you know and you know (laughs) that you're like uh well then what did i just say oh we were talking about a restaurant so they get like the general idea (laughs) of what is going on but it's like no 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 no, but you're missing the details i asked you which restaurant do you want to go to (laughs) Oh, I can't. Yeah, and it's stand uh, it's that. even the, the the whole other level of it though is um, when they won't even look up from the phone, right? No, that's yeah, the other that's one. so that, rude. It's one thing if because you can kind of tell sometimes they'll look at you and you can tell when they're looking at you like you're still thinking about what's on the phone, aren't you? And <laughs> but they're looking at you. Yes. And you're like they have that glazed over look, like they're taking extra long to process. Right. At least you gave me the courtesy of an eye look. But she was doing that thing where she didn't even look up from the phone as she was talking to him. And you can't. I will life lesson, everybody. Teachable moment. You cannot multitask. It is scientifically proven that you cannot multitask. What you can do. No, not like that. What you do when people, when you quote unquote multitask is you switch mentally between two tasks every couple seconds, which slows you down in both tasks. Yes. And so people think they're multitasking and it's like a cute trick people's brains pick on them. It cannot be done Effe- effectively, right. and I, I should just, say. You can do a half ass job yeah. with two things at once. Which is why I find it incredibly frustrating that Louisa is just like my friend. It's like she's super defensive. She is convinced she can do two things at once. Mm-hmm. And it's like, do you see, do you even know how this looks to other people? You're not paying attention well. So that was the first thing that I was like, don't like this girl. Then her whole thing where she was just rude to him. And like, get it, I get it. He was hollow at worst to her. Mm -hmm. Like he never was rude to her, but he wasn't especially like warm with her either Mm -hmm. like he he, everything he just said was like neutral or very hollow it's like very like robotic like he's such a Uh robot sometimes you know but the way that she would talk with him and joke with him like and i say joke with him Mm -hmm. like in quotes she was just straight up rude bitch yeah yeah i mean it just it just kind of shows me like you can't and this was another thing he did 
when you're just getting to know somebody and you're kind of acquaintances and you're friends, you kind of mm-hmm. don't let the worst parts of your personality shine through, right? And once yeah. you like move in with someone, that's when you get tired. That's when you get hungry. That's when you get like, you know, yes. a little emo. And that's when you start to be like all the worst aspects of your personality come out. And so it's not that they're crazy. It's that just like you you keep meeting with somebody who has only shown you their good sides and you're going to fight and you're going to get into people and you don't know what those people are going to be like when they, you know, when they get to that point, when they get to that comfort level or. Yeah. So like when they get in their fight and he's leaving the hotel room and she throws out a bye Felicia, it's like <laughs> two things. I cannot imagine ever saying that to any person that is a friend because that's just rude. You know? Right. And then second of all, like, Muhammad has no idea what that means. What? You don't think Muhammad's seen Friday? <laughs> no. Muhammad has, that is completely lost to Muhammad. I get what you're trying to go through for, like, in terms of effect, but he's uh-huh. just, like, leaving the room thinking, my name isn't Felicia. Who is this Felicia? Is that is that an adjective or something? Okay. Before we move on, <laughs> I want to talk about, I, I need to talk about Gabe before we move on. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. We still, I feel like I have a ton of notes on Danielle and Muhammad. So, okay. Yeah. Let's talk uh, about uh, Gabe. Yes. Gabe, who uh, isn't the most attractive person, but is still way too hot for Danielle. Yes. I feel like he could do well for himself in Ohio. Because, oh, yeah, for definitely. one, which is going to put him ahead above everyone else, is that he's fit. Yeah. Yeah. Like, he had did like, I the cut, picture... the hip cut things. Yeah, and the I was thing, gonna say, yeah, did six I pack? picture oh, the six goodness. pack? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you'd like take off his head, like that in itself is gonna get you a lot of girls. Right. Right. He's gonna yeah, he'll do just fine. But I mean, he prefers heavy set women. That is okay. odd to me. It's always odd to me because it's like those are completely different lifestyles. So clearly mm-hmm. this guy works out. And actually thinks Obviously. and yeah. does a lot with his body, right? If he's got mm-hmm. a six pack. It confuses me. And I know there's people like this out there. It confuses me when those kinds of fit people are like, yeah, I'm really into like the big girls who eat a lot and don't work out. Or at least if they do, it's very low priority. You know, it's like those are very different lifestyles. It confuses me. Yeah, I mean, I think if you want to give it an ungenerous gloss, um, I mean, the generous gloss is you, you're attracted to what you're attracted to. Okay, like, you know, right, sometimes you can't Right, but then why are you it. prioritizing your own fitness? Your own fitness? Is my guess. Yeah. True. Is my question, I guess. The ungenerous view is guys like that want to go out with, you know, heavier women because they feel like the heavier women will be, like, appreciative and they'll do things for them. They'll feel like they... You know, they're always trying to be proven to that they belong in the relationship. You know what I'm saying? Like, sure. The, you kind of have them where you have the power in the relationship because you're the hotter one in the relationship and they have to do things. I can to see you. that. Yeah. OK, I can definitely see that. But that to me is something different than the attraction piece, I guess. Right. Yes. Because he specifically said yeah. that he found her fit that he met because he found her physically attractive. Right. I don't know. And then my first always thought with any of these shows is like, and even Louisa, like right when I first met Louisa, it was like, Louisa's a pretty face. I can see her trying to be an influencer or try to capitalize on this fame. She is the Uh type, you know? So it's always like, I always wonder when they're meeting people that are already established on this show. Like, what are your intentions? So that mm-hmm. was my first thought. But Gabe doesn't really come off as someone who's like trying to have a media following. No, no. But I don't. Yeah, I don't know. If we saw, you know, his his six pack picture was a Instagram picture, I thought. So, I mean, he's there yeah. and he could maybe he's just trying to maybe yeah, maybe his grand scheme is if I say that I'm into heavier women, I will get all these heavy women to follow me <laughs> and I'll have all these new <laughs> followers. There's more heavy women than fit women out there. Exactly, so exactly. That's my market. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, Danielle, so they kind of talk about how Danielle is like, you know, an older woman. And he says he likes heavier, older women, which I'm like, who? Who is this person? You're like a <laughs> unicorn. What the hell? I, I know. So, <laughs> 
Why can't there be more like of you, I guess? I don't know. If you put that expression uh, out there, he really can do okay in Ohio. <laughs> if he's looking for heavier yeah, older women, I'm know, sure right? he can do just right. fine. <laughs> but I'm thinking, Danielle is not your typical older woman, especially because he was saying what he likes about older women. He's like, oh, they're really oh, decisive. True. They know what they want. They're mature. It's like, Danielle mm, is none of these things. None of those things, right. You know? She, she oh, and think, like yeah. you were saying, she act like a teenager, like her giggling oh, and her hanging on oh, him. It made me so uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah, it did. It's it, like oh, we just, know that this is not her first time at the rodeo. She has like five children for the love of God, you know, but it's like, yes, I, I don't understand why she acts like this is the first man who's ever given her attention. She was like that with Muhammad as well. Yeah, because I, I, I wouldn't. I would probably bet they're the two most attractive men that have given her attention. Yeah. Eh. Right. One of her kids is like really cute. So it's like her dad must have been good looking. Maybe. I don't know. I've I've definitely known two unfortunate looking people that had a really cute he had really cute kids, but it happens. <laughs> <laughs> oh good. No, but I was gonna say, because all the other kids kind of look more like her. And then they she has that do. one yeah. daughter that's like she didn't get blessed with Danielle's poor vision. Because that's the one thing. Is oh, like right. All those kids have like the this. thickest glasses. Right. They do. They do. And they all wear the same like frames. And I don't know if it's like where their nose is compared to their face. But like they all have frames that are like barely. Their eyes are like almost out of the top of the glasses frames. I don't know what's oh, up with that. Oh, yeah. Either. It's like Coke bottle. And then the, because of the distance, it magnifies their eyes even more and makes it like more obvious. Yeah, I don't know, because I don't know anything oh, about, I've never worn glasses, so I don't know. I've never tried different glass frames on my face, but I feel like they could do better frame-wise, even with the big, thick glasses. Oh, I mean, nowadays, absolutely you can. Like, okay, so I have a really strong, strong prescription, so I have pretty thick glasses. But, I mean, you pay a little bit extra to get the thinner lenses. You know, like, there's technologies mm -hmm. available nowadays. Like, they have lighter frames, lighter lenses, all that stuff. And, I mean, there's only so much you can do because my glasses, especially one of my eyes, is especially thick. And there's really mm -hmm. not a whole lot you can do with it. But, I mean, stylish frames also goes a long way as well, you know? Right. That's what I'm saying. There's things you can do. All right. Anything else you want to talk about with them? Uh, no. Yeah. I think theirs was the most interesting segment to me. Yeah. Plenty, spending plenty of time well, with them. Well, we can talk about them, like, well. the entire. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So, let's talk Russ and Powell. So, we're told once again that Powell is the only one working. She shows up to her monthly job shooting a commercials for Bob's Tractor. Tractor Bob! <laughs> yep, Tractor Bob. So Bob knows, Tractor Bob, he knows what sells, which is less clothing. Russ feels like since he is the man of the house, he should be the breadwinner, and he is unnerved that this is not what's happening. Pow is talking to the director of the commercial, and he encourages her to move to a big city if she wants to pursue modeling. Powell likes the idea of Miami because there's a big Latin population and culture there. She is going to try and use her sexy skills to convince Russ to move to Miami. But in the meantime, she plans on staying there for a while to visit different agencies and stay with her friend Jenny to save money. Russ wants to be supportive of Powell following her dreams, so he does eventually support her decision to go. What he doesn't support is Powell's very unsupportive bikinis. Russ is starting to have doubts about uh, what a move would mean for his career. But Powell arrives in Miami where we get a lot of TNA shots of her getting out of the cab while we hear Russ talking about how he worries about Powell's safety when she travels outside of Oklahoma. Powell visits her friend Jenny and is so excited to hit the beach and go clubbing. She knows that wanting to live in Miami will cause problems in her relationship with Russ. Russ is concerned about these modeling agencies taking advantage of Powell. We see Pow at an agency getting measured by an agent who tells her that she's beautiful, but then she becomes hesitant when she sees Pow's portfolio and find out, finds out that Pow is married. The agent, Caroline, says that she will set up a photo shoot for the next day, but if she wants to work with her, Pow will need to move to Miami. All right, so do you think that Pow really has what it takes to be a successful model? 
seeing what you've seen. And I understand you're not an industry, but... I'm not an industry. Yeah. So... You're not a talent agent. (laughs) I'm not a talent agent. I know nothing about, yeah, any of that. But I don't know. We're kind of like Ofer, right? Doesn't everybody want to be a model that comes over? Yeah. And we've talked about this before. I, I do know enough to know that there's way more to modeling than just, you know, having a good body. Like that's not right enough. And so I think that's what the talent agent who was kind of getting at was like, these pictures are clearly amateur pictures. And so I can't tell anything from them. Like I can't tell how well you photograph mm-hmm. because the photographer wasn't any good. So I got to like, right. Do more of that because we your saw photographer it. Being your husband, your husband, right. There's definitely <laughs> yeah. attractive people who can't, who just don't make it as models just because they kind of are flat in their pictures and they don't like pop in a picture, even though they're like, generally attractive in real life right like we kind of saw that with uh, alexi yes alexi has like a really good body Mm -hmm. you know and he just seems so stiff and hollow when he had his test shoot right exactly and uh, you know some people can do it some people can it's just it's just the same way it's it's not quite acting but it is acting in a way and it does take a talent that's not just right hey you have big boobs and a, and a round butt so model model time it is interesting what photographs well i don't watch this show very often like i've maybe seen like two or three episodes of the bazillion episodes they had but america's next top model like mm-hmm. i am always very shocked at what those people look like in real life as opposed to what their pictures end up being, you know? And people that I don't find especially attractive, and if I saw them, like, out and about, I probably wouldn't even know that they were a model other than they're, like, crazy tall. Mm -hmm. It's, like, it's so interesting to me that the way they get them to look with the makeup and the fashion and stuff, it's like, wow, that's really high fashion. Like, that's crazy, the transformation you see. But right, how I, I don't think is trying to be a high fashion model. No, because she like, does not really have she does not kind. have the body for that. I mean, she is no, she doesn't too short and too curvy to have to work right. There. Um, and so I don't yeah I don't know what kind of modeling she wants to do. Like I I kind of got the impression model? she wanted to do like I, she wanted to do like ad ad modeling more yeah. or less. But I feel like even that Miami is not the best place to be. You got to be in New York for that. You know, I don't know right, what kind of modeling true. industry they have in Miami either. I don't know. Bikini modeling because there's beaches. I, I guess they do more shoots like that. I just don't know. I mean, I really don't know enough about the industry to even know oh, what yeah. types of jobs are available for different types of models. Like, I don't think she wants she wants to do more than what she's do. She doesn't want to do trade shows. She doesn't want to do, um, you know, on sites um, like cause that's like she's been doing in Oklahoma City. Side note, it bothers me how, how they keep trashing Oklahoma City as like a small town. Like, it's a city. <laughs> they have a basketball team right. and everything. It's not like it's yeah. nowhere. I mean, it's not as big as Miami. It's not as big as New York or L.A., but it's still legitimately a city. It's not a small town. But I think, like, the thought is, is, like, let's just say the uh, acting piece of it. Forget the modeling, because I feel like modeling can really be done anywhere because of how easy is it to, like, take a picture Um, But I think if you're, like, trying to look for legitimate acting jobs and things like that, like, that's where it's, like, you're not going to find a whole lot of legitimate acting jobs in Oklahoma. There's Bob's Tractor, right? Mm -hmm. But Tractor Bob. But other than that, it's, like, what other opportunities do you have other than local commercials? There's not, like, TV shows or, you know, films being taped there or anything like that right but that's independent of the size of a city like they keep crapping on the oh, size right, of the city. Right. Like houston and phoenix are huge you can't be an actor in houston or phoenix either like <laughs> yeah okay that's true okay yes i can see to that um I, okay so the reason why i kind of asked that is because i think pow is a pretty girl and i'm not saying she isn't but i don't think there's anything like when i look at her there's nothing that's like, oh my gosh, she is so gorgeous or she's just so unique. And I think uh-huh. all the things that kind of like to me are like, oh, that's attractive feature is like something that isn't natural. You know, mm. it's like, OK, you know, like she probably has hair extensions. She probably, you know, like has 
I don't know, it's like her makeup or, you know, so things like that where and it's like her fake boobs. It's like all those things. It's just kind of like, eh. Right. So it's I, like I, a dime I, a dozen if it's like, you know, yeah, manufactured. I, I, yeah, I'm with you, too, because I think it's a relatively small industry. Right. And so it's mm-hmm. not like being an engineer where if you're in the top 10 percent of engineers, you're doing pretty well for yourself. But if you're in the top 10 yeah. percent of, say, basketball players, you're not a professional basketball player. Right. You could be better right. than 90 percent. You could be hotter than 99 percent of people and still not be hot enough to be a model. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people in the world, right? A lot of people in the world <laughs> yeah. that are trying to be model. OK, I let's kind of go back to this. Why does everybody want to be a model? Like, let's really get to the root of this, because I feel like this is a recurring thing. That's Why true. is it that everybody has this like idea that modeling is like the the life goal? You know, I think like if we're to break it down, these are the things that I can kind of think of is that it's like people just have this like need to be famous. Mm -hmm. But then it's like, why do you need to be famous for modeling? I think it's because they think, well, modeling compared to like acting or singing is is easy. You just sit around and someone (laughs) takes your, yes, low skill, right? right? So what can I do that is low skill will get me famous And get me a lot of money because I think right now it's kind of, quote, easy to be famous. I mean, reality stars are famous, whereas in people know them and could recognize them. Mm -hmm. Like if you're an influencer, you're famous. But does that even translate to money these days? Yeah. For some people, it does. For some people, it doesn't. Um, But the ones I find I would say for most people, it doesn't. Yeah, I would say the ones who make I, – I, I'm always surprised at how much people can make, not necessarily being influencers. I don't think influencers make the money. Like there are people who can make money yeah. you know, online. There are definitely YouTube people who make you know millions a year. But when I right. watch them, I'm like I could not do what they do. Like even if, if, I, felt, if I like yeah. it, if I don't like it, you know, whatever it is, I'm like – sometimes they're like, wow, this person taps into a market I would have never thought to appeal to and I have no way of appealing <laughs> right. to. So good for them. Sometimes they make animations and things like that that I'm like, wow, I do not have the skills to make those. Good for them. Like, and so sometimes I can appreciate what they do. But like, yeah, I think I think it was a huge crash. And I think especially now that, you know, the economy is going so yeah. bad that there's just not going to be we're going to. Oh, I'm going to throw money because you took because, you know, because they kind of want it. I already take hot selfies all day. Go, can I just like make money yeah. doing that? Do what you love. Right. Age. Do what you love. It's actually kind of funny. So my sister, she works for a bathing suit company and she actually does the um, marketing for a bathing suit company and specifically with e-commerce. And she was kind of talking to me about the agreements they have with their influencers. And I was just like, I was looking at her. I was like, how does your company pay that person that absurd amount of money for something that she gets, she is trying to get her company to stop it because she was just like, this does not equate to sales. Right. You know, like that's another thing. It's a, that's been coming out recently. Yeah. Yes. Like 10 units. She's like, this is ridiculous. The amount of money you're spending on this person. So they're actually right now in the process of trying to restructure like their you know, funding for their influencers. And it's so I I have a feeling like, you know, especially with the economy, the way it is right now, it's like prioritizing where you're spending your marketing dollars. I have a feeling like this is going to be a big loss for a lot of people who are trying to be sponsored and things like that. Yeah, I remember thinking the same kind of thing back when you remember MTV used to have cribs, right? MTV Cribs was on. Yeah. And I would always be uh-huh. somebody like some backbencher who's like they were like they would be like the third or fourth character in a random like Fox sitcom. And you're like, who is this person? I barely even know who they are. And they go to their crib yeah. and they're like, well, here's our three car garage and my two Ferraris. And over here I have my wine cellar with I'm like, what the crap? How do you make this much money? <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It is amazing to me how much uh, the uh industry entertainment industry like pays it's so crazy and i think there is this perceived like you said low skill which is why everybody wants to do it it's like in the end it's like i feel like people want to be models and work in the entertainment industry because they feel like oh well this is the lazy way of making a lot of money yeah basically basically i I think they're often mistaken (laughs) 
<laughs> yes, yeah. Right. I'm not saying that that's the reality, but I think it's that perception that it's this easy way to make a lot of money, and so that's why everybody wants to do it. Right. Okay, we definitely right, went so off on a tangent, so let's refocus. Moving on. Moving on. <laughs> you want to yeah. keep going? Move on? All right, move on. Melanie and Devar. Yeah, you have Melanie and Devar, yeah. Yeah. So Melanie and Devar have finally reached Jamaica. They've been together in Jamaica many times before, but this time it's different because they're going to be leaving together, and therefore they don't have to spend all of their time having sex. The big issue for this trip is the big issue for their entire storyline. How much money is Devar going to give to his family? Specifically, they're going to be grilling some fish with Devar's sister, Punkisha. We get to the fish fry and Punkisha says she isn't working because she's going to go back to school and that she can't work while she's doing that because that's really stressful. There seems to be a really big cultural divide here regarding the nature of work and the nature of sharing money. Devar tells us that in Jamaican culture, it's kind of an expectation that the person who is working should openly share what they have. Melanie has a much more American attitude of, if you can work, you work. Devar asks Melanie to try to put herself in Punkisha's shoes, uh, and how would she feel if someone was able to help her out, but was refusing to? Melanie basically says she can't put herself in Punkisha's shoes, because she would never even accept, let alone ask for money, if the only reason she didn't have money is because she was choosing not to work. So, uh, I feel like giving back to family is the only thing they talk about ever, the whole time. Mm -hmm. So, since they're always stuck on one issue like this, can a relationship really survive if there's one issue that just will not be resolved? Uh, that's a good question. I kind of wonder if they're still arguing about it now because I think what is the most frustrating is because it seemed like they resolved at least the current issue of mm -hmm. the much larger issue, right? Which was how much money are we going to give her right now? And it right. seemed like they resolved it, and it seems like Devar went completely against it. <laughs> so it's like you can say that you're you're coming to uh, a compromise, but it wasn't really a compromise because he just kind of like did his own thing in the end anyway. And that's got to be incredibly frustrating for Melanie, right? And I couldn't really tell because he did the thing where he just like gave her some money and then gave her more money, and I it sounded yes. like it was more, and than, it was in than, foreign than currency. To. Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely not in U.S. dollars. It was not U.S. dollars. That's correct. But yeah, but you couldn't tell what they were. Right. So we have no idea how so much money he actually gave her. We don't know. He could have been giving her the hundred that he that Melanie originally said. And uh -huh. then then he's like, oh, and then here's a little bit more. And it could have been like the extra 50 <laughs> that they compromised on. Right. It right, could have right. been that. We have no idea. But I think the thing that annoyed me the most about that was Melanie Navarre had this extensive conversation about how Punkisha, you know, what money they're going to give her continuously, right? Yes. And Melanie was kind of like, no, we do no this is like a one-time thing. We'll revisit it on an as-needs basis was the impression right. I got from their conversation. Right. Whereas Devar, when he's like talking to his sister about it, he's, he's just like, like, oh, anything you want, Anytime come get you me. need anything... Yeah. yeah, like, don't even be embarrassed about it. He's, like, trying to make it a welcome situation to yeah. ask for money. You know, it's like, yeah, just even if you even think about money, just, like, call me. It's just like, oh, my gosh. Like, Melody is probably like, what are you doing? We're not trying to encourage her yeah, to exactly. ask for money. Right. You right. know, but if she needs it, like, we'll definitely help her you, out. But Because you said it in that thing. Just, he was like, yeah. you don't even be embarrassed to ask. And Melanie's like, what? You should be embarrassed to ask. What are you talking about? That <laughs> you Definitely yes. should be embarrassed to ask for Don't money. Don't even ask. What are you doing? Unless you you should be desperate for money when you're asking. Uh, so okay, I agree with Melanie, but she does have some odd logic here. Uh, for the most uh -huh. part, the thing that I think I struggle with with like Devar and like the way he's thinking about giving money and things like that is, I I guess I always see it as if your thought or, you know, um, what you kind of believe is kind of like if the majority of people believe, how would the world be, right? So if mm -hmm. the majority of everyone kind of believed, okay, well, I should just wait around for my family to give me money, you're, and if everyone believed that, there's going to be no one in your family to give money, Right? Because everybody's just like, oh, well, I'll just leave it to someone else to give me money. 
I don't know. It seems to me that the, what they were getting at, and, and they didn't really make this clear in the show, was it's not everybody sitting around. It's like everybody takes turns making money. And whoever's making the money takes care of the people who aren't making money right now. And right now it's kind of like Devar's turn. Well, to me, I kind of interpreted it as that it's whoever's the older person. So yeah. you kind of like have all the old people making money until I guess they retire. And then mm-hmm. whoever's next will make money until they retire. But to me, that's like, oh, well, that's great if you're like, you know, in a generational thing. But if you're just talking about a bunch of siblings, it's like, sweet, I'm the youngest sibling. I don't have to work because all my older siblings are going to work. Because they kept on talking about how the reason why Davar was giving her money is because she's the littler sister and Mm -hmm. he's the bigger brother. And so to me, it seemed like, oh, well, because he's the older one, that's the reason why he's giving money to his younger siblings. Like he's the one who has to take care of them. Yeah, I I mean... Obviously, we're both Americans and we're both pretty hardworking people. Um, And so, you know, I definitely was raised the way more the way Melanie was raised of like, no, if you can get a job, you get a job. That's that it it doesn't make. So it is harder for us to wrap our heads around it because it is not just it's a very deep seated way of thinking and way of viewing the world. And so, you know, I'm trying to I I try to justify it. But in my head, I'm just like the same way. I'm just like I but get a job. And to be fair to her, I'm more generous with my money if somebody's going to school. If she's like, oh, I can't I can't work as much because I'm trying to get myself through school, then that's a little more like, okay, you're doing something to improve your situation. It's a long-term strategic thing. You're going to make more money at the end. Okay, I can help you out while you're going to school. Whereas, so I, I, I didn't quite appreciate, Melanie took it a little bit too far. It was like, no, 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 why are you going to school if you can work? I don't understand. This is dumb. Go, go work. Right. Well, I feel like, okay, well, I kind of could see what Melanie's perspective is, is because it didn't seem like Plunkisha really wanted to go to school. It was just kind of like, well, I'm not really doing anything. I guess I could go to school. It's like, oh, I'm bored. What can I do? Oh, I guess I could just go to school. So I can see from her perspective how she's like, okay, so you're going to pay to go to school and you don't really seem all that enthusiastic about it. You haven't even said what you want to study there. That's you're just true. like, oh, right. I guess I'm going to go to school. So I can see that. But okay, let's kind of go back to what I said about Melanie's weird logic. Uh, what I didn't agree with Melanie and her weird logic was that she said that they should only be giving money to Punkisha if she has a job. Like, oh, well, if she has a job and she's not making enough to help herself, then we can give her money. But if she doesn't have a job, why are we going to give her money? Right. Like, and then, yeah, and then divorce logic was like, why would, she need, why would she need money if she has a job? This is yes. just, That's dumb logic. <laughs> right. I think it might be a uni- another American thing because at, in America, I know – if you're working full time at minimum wage, you are still falling yeah. behind and you still need right. help. Right. Yeah. I, that's what I was thinking Melanie was coming from was that like, oh, well, I can understand if you need help, if you're like trying, but you can't make enough. Whereas right. maybe in Jamaica, if anyone has a job, they're fine. So why mm-hmm. would I need money if I had a job? Right. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, OK, moving on. Okay, we have Brett and Daya, who we didn't see in the first two episodes, or Mr. O saw because he accidentally (laughs) saw the third episode. Mm -hmm. So we open up on Brett rapping for some bizarre reason. It's not bad. I just don't want to see his face when he's doing it. (laughs) So they recap their story, and Brett's biggest takeaway is that when you promise something to Daya, you follow through. Fast forward to now, Cassidy, Brett's daughter, and Daya have a close relationship. Uh, Brett and Daya are packing up their stuff because they have just bought a house, which is just a little outside of Brett's financial comfort zone. Uh, Brett plans on working 10 hours a day and weekends to make this work. Since the wedding, Dawn, Brett's mom, has slowly been working on her relationship with Daya. Daya still wants to have a relationship with Dawn despite the fact that she didn't go to their wedding. Brett is telling Daya not to talk about the price of the house because he doesn't want his mother judging their financial situation and blaming Daya. Brett picks up his mom to see the house, and Brett thinks that it's awkward. Don is impressed by how big the house is. She assumes that it was a lot of money. 
Brett awkwardly says it's more money than they wanted to spend, and Don surmises that they went over budget and that Daya was the one who wanted a big master bedroom with a walk-in closet. Brett takes the blame and says that he was the one who said the house was the one. All right. Have you ever bought something that was significantly out of budget? No. <laughs> I'm, I'm a very stick to the budget. Not by 50000 That's a lot <laughs> to be out of budget. I mean, yes, 50000 especially because, I don't know. I don't know the housing market there very much. You know, that house, depending on where you bought it, right, that mm-hmm. house could be anywhere from you know, a $150,000 house to a like $700,000 house, depending on where it is, right? Like right. That, it's Edward that house, Washington. I don't really know. Which is, I mean, it's because we know he, we, we were, at least we were, we surmised last time that he works for Boeing. So it's, it's kind of near yeah. where Boeing is in the Seattle area. And I just don't know the housing right. market. Like I even, even there here. There are pockets yeah. of Washington that are expensive and it has to do with who your major industries are surrounding. I bet. So if you're like close to, you know, your big giant tech companies, like your Amazons and your Microsoft, Microsofts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, so if you're close to those areas, it's the housing is gonna be more expensive than you're kind of in the backwoods somewhere. Right, so, and that's that's an interesting thing too, because, you know, Dawn was saying, this house is so big and it's, I don't know, yeah. it's so big, but I, I would bet that the, actual price of a house has way more to do with um, its location than it has to do with anything that is in the house, right? If he can sure. walk to, I'm sure if he could walk to his job at the Boeing factory, it's a lot more of expensive house than if, it, if <laughs> yeah. he had to, you know, drive two hours to get there. Because even like, even in this area, the housing prices are, you know, you'll pay twice as much for a house if it's in one county as it is in another county. Like it's. Right. Just because of location. Absolutely. Yeah. So I don't even know why you would decide like, oh, I'm going to overextend myself, go 50,000 out of budget. And even his plan for how to pay it off, I'm just like, what the hell? You're gonna work 10 hour days and weekends? I'm going to never spend any time in this house so I can pay for this house. (laughs) Yeah, so it's just like, that just sounds like a terrible financial plan. It it does, but I don't know. Did you ever watch House Hunters? It's, I feel like it's always like that. Like they're always like, our budget is 250,000. How much was the house? 307, 335. And you're like, that was not your budget. What are you talking about? (laughs) Like they always go for the more expensive house. And I always feel like when I watch that show, that that was always a play like by real estate agents to be like, it's okay to extend and go over your budget by 40 or 50,000. That's fine. Let's put that on TV and normalize it. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I'm okay, more okay with the going out of budget thing. And I think it kind of depends on how you calculated that budget too. Yes. You know, if you calculated that budget like, oh, well, you know, I don't know, that just seems like a reasonable number that I can afford. Or if you were like, okay, how much money am I actually pulling in per month? And how much do we want to spend on, you know, how much could we like max be able to spend? If you came up with your budget based on actual numbers, then to me it's kind of like, well, maybe you shouldn't go past that if that means you're having to work like depend on 10 hour days and weekends. Because to me that kind of sounds like you're relying on overtime, which isn't guaranteed. So I am a little suspicious about this because you know who else knows mm-hmm. that overtime isn't guaranteed and they won't depend on overtime for um, the loan? Your bank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the bank. Yeah. Uh, so they still got the loan. So I don't know, like you said, I yeah. don't know where the budget came from. Because yeah, I, I don't, as far as I'm concerned, if you just said this sounds like a good number, then you didn't actually make a budget. You just set a goal. Right. You, a budget right. means you ran hard numbers and, and did that. And I can't imagine that, like, I don't know, I guess you can. I, I, hmm. Wasn't that what the housing crash happened? I feel like people can't go ex- overextend their, like, budgets like that anymore. I guess you could if you leverage a lot of stuff. But that just seems, again, like a very yeah. poor, poor decision. Right. But, yeah, this is kind of tough to, tough situation, too, because I, I believe Daya has a job at this point. Right. And I say I believe because uh, it's starting to mix in because I watched the quarantine episode and Brett and Daya were on the quarantine episode where Daya clearly has a job. Okay. So I'm kind of like, I think she has a job. Even in this episode, they mention that she has a job. And so it's like, it's not like, 
you know, Brett doesn't have financial help, but it's like with your two incomes, you're still having to rely on, you know. But then again, what, maybe it's also another thing where it's like, well, he wants to work more so that way they can enjoy more things, you know, like they can spend money outside of the house. I guess people, yeah, and, and that's what I get. I gather too is I gather, yeah, you can either if. if you know, if things squeeze you, you can either make more money or spend less money. And I don't know what else they're spending their money on. Yeah. Um, that they that right. they could have brought that out and he chose to work instead. But yeah, just it always seems like people are working their life away. So they have no and then they because they spend so much time working, they have no time to enjoy the money that they made. God, this this hits a little too close to home right now. <laughs> anyway, back up. All right. Two things uh, I want we'll to on. touch on. You okay. mentioned it. He was not yeah. a good rapper. That was terrible rapping. <laughs> it was okay. I just don't want to see his weird facial expressions. Good. Like, did not like it. He uh, and his um, like and his boom when he's like boom, boom oh my God. and then he like does that like but hand rhymed, throwing dice thing. He did I was like, a oh, rap stop about it. how his wife is from the Philippines. Oh my God. Okay. Anyway, back up. <laughs> so I throw shade at his rap. That's all I wanted to do. Just that and then why did they pick his mom up at a shopping center and then drive her to the house because they she was afraid she might get lost it like doesn't she have a phone with like gps and stuff i don't understand what happened there i don't know i you know i never assume that older people have any of these things and i say that because my parents don't you know, so my parents, like, they just refuse to get data on their phone. They just think it's an expense they don't need. Um, uh, and, like, to be uh, honest, my parents aren't on their phone all the time. And so it's not like, you know, they're at a random store and they're like, oh, I need to look this up. Like, they would never occur to them to do that. Like, maybe it would occur to them, like, I wish I had that information, but it would never occur to them to be like, let me look this up on my phone. And so I know mm -hmm. how it is right now if they're going somewhere that they have never been before it's like they will be on their computer and they will look up the directions on the computer and they will write it down, you know, which is uh -huh. fine. But then it's like it's not the same when you're like not in context of it. Right. Right. So you're kind of like, well, how far away is Jefferson Street? I have no idea. Did we pass like it already? It, and it says exactly. like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, did we? Did we? Because you have no context in terms of like the other street. Oh, I know Jefferson is after Washington. Okay, mm -hmm. well that means I passed it or I didn't. You don't have any landmarks, and so I know it can be incredibly difficult. Like when I give my dad uh, directions to like some place kind of closer to me, I have to be really, really specific. I have to give him a bunch of landmarks. Like if you see the Starbucks off to the side, you know, you know you're on the right track. Like things like that. So I can understand stand that maybe Brett's mom doesn't have GPS. It's possible. I mean, uh -huh. Brett's mom seems a little bit younger than my parents, but I never assume that people are using Yeah, that's that's, data that's funny or GPS. because it, I, I usually see it the other way. You know, sometimes when I'll ask my parents, like, mm -hmm. where is it? I always want the address and they'll start saying, well, you got to get on this road. I'm like, no, 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 no. I didn't, didn't yeah. need to get me directions. <laughs> I just needed to tell me what the address was. But no, because my... That's what my dad would do, too. My parents are a bit younger than yours, and my mom is on board, mm -hmm. but my dad is not, and it's super annoying because he does all the things, but he just relies on everybody else. He's like, what do I need yeah. data for? I don't need a cell phone. I was like, yes, you do. It's just because he's always around somebody who does. <laughs> like, So you'll be with them in the store, and instead of saying, oh, man, I wonder how much this is at Target, instead of like, you know, like I would do, pulling out his phone and looking it up, he turns to me and goes, how much is it, is it Target? <laughs> I'm like, oh, damn it. <laughs> Like, so he doesn't need a phone because everybody else has a phone. And so he does that stuff. Like, right. Tell me how to get there. I'm like, oh, dad, fine. <sighs> Somebody look it up. So he just uses everybody else's phones. Yeah. It's actually kind of funny, like, the way my parents, like, do things. And I mean, like, I, re I mean, we're old enough where we remember what life was like without the internet. Uh -huh. You know? And, uh, I mean, we were young, but, you know, I still remember things. But it's like my parents, it's like they never really know. I feel like they don't, I feel like they don't know what's going on, like, out and about, you know? But it's like, they'll be like, oh, there's a new IHOP opening up. And it's like, they know because they just drive by it. But if an IHOP opened up, like, in an area, they don't, they would just never know. Never know. 
Never know. They'd be like, oh, I wish there was an IHOP near us. And I say that because IHOP is currently their favorite restaurant. Uh-huh. But, you know, they would be like, oh, I wish there was an IHOP near, uh, closer to us. And it'd be like, well, who knows? There could be. You just don't know because you didn't look it up online. <laughs> you don't drive anywhere else. You have your one road to drive. Yeah, over. you don't drive on that route, you know? So it's like you, everything they know is like from just them being out and about. So, all right. Who was, we'll go to Students of the Week. Who was your Student of the Week? I actually said my student of the week was Daya because I thought that it was really big of her to try be the better person, take the high road. And she says that she still wants to have a relationship with Brett's mom, even though Brett's mom is arguably terrible from like the season that she was in. You know, Mm -hmm. the fact that she didn't even come to the wedding, I think, is like a big deal. And the fact that Daya is willing to kind of move on from that, I was like, good for you. That's, I don't know. I can't say that I would not do the same, but I would probably still be really hurt that, and I I probably wouldn't trust her, to be honest, if I were in that situation. Sure. What about you? Mine was actually Pow, because I feel like she was the only person that was having fun this entire episode. <laughs> well, fun she was having, definitely. <laughs> and I, I I did feel good for her. Like she she kind of, you know, instead of just pouting about her situation, she like kind of went out and found the situation that she wanted to have, you know, to it's kind true. of see mm-hmm. what it was. She wanted not wait for somebody else to deliver her that. So I said pout. Yeah. That's very true. All right. So what about your dunce? Uh, my debt was, dunce was actually Brett um, because okay. he still doesn't stand up to his mom and no, he kind of he doesn't defer like oh i guess i don't know well i guess it was ultimately my decision hmm. instead of just definitively saying like you know because at some point his mom would starts talking about oh gee i don't know about their thing and he's like we already bought the house mom like wh- whatever yeah. you have to say doesn't we already bought the house why are you complaining right. about the house we bought just stop mom like yeah you know it was oh, already, okay the, okay mom let me turn around and sell the house now it's yeah like, uh-huh. what, and, and so he just kind of, okay, instead of like actually do? talking to his mom, he just kind of goes, oh, gee, oh, okay, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, some people. And then also I didn't like his rapping. So, Brett. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, I was like, well, he should be dunced just for his rapping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, my dunce was Davar. And I said uh, it was because I feel like he's enabling his sister. Mm-hmm. And also going back on his word with his wife, or at least it appeared to. So, all right. Uh, what about your life lesson? My life lesson is that revenge is overrated. Okay. So we talked about oh, sure. that Danielle was given the two choices by the lawyer. Get it done quick with the divorce yep. or get revenge with the annulment. And she's going she for revenge with the revenge. annulment. And Even though it costs money and she clearly doesn't have money. Yeah. I just, whether Muhammad is in Florida or in Tunisia makes zero difference to Danielle's life. It will not no, make her life it, better if he's out. It's so, so why ridiculous. why is she doing that? Why? Yeah. Just get like it done, she says, like, I don't want him in my country. We can't possibly be in the same country at the same time. Like the same country. It's like, oh my gosh. 2,000 miles apart. It doesn't just, he, he's gone. Just get him out of your life. And you, you're going to drag it out. You're going to cost more money. You're going to be a bigger pain in the butt for yourself. For yeah. what? And you're not, your life will not be any better because even if you win, your life will not be any better. So don't go for revenge. Just do what's best for you. Yeah. I think that's uh, just kind of a good life lesson. It's just like, I know it's, I know it's easier said than done, but you just kind of have to let it go because this is the crap that doesn't matter in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Like, why does it matter? Even if he was deported, why is that going to matter to you in 10 years? And are you going to be upset if he finds another woman to marry and comes back? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, so my life lesson, actually, Danielle and Muhammad, once again, uh, you should be wary about anyone who is trying to include you on major life decisions when you don't know each other or haven't met. <laughs> True. So, jeez, Muhammad. That like, is What are you crazy. doing? Don't. I mean, okay, we say that. That's weird. But, like, people do move in with people they've never met before. They're called roommates. But, like. Yeah, that, that's a totally different that's situation. A different situation. <laughs> Very different. Uh, yeah, he could have like yeah, just gone on Craigslist, but clearly this was like he was trying to culture some kind of relationship. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I mean, he's definitely trying to 
kill two birds with one stone, but uh, yeah, that's also yeah. a bad idea. Yeah, don't don't it's yeah, crazy town. Oh, also, don't make giant life decisions with somebody you're clearly just trying to hook up with either. So that's another one that you should probably just avoid. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, okay, so. I think that's, that's it. it. Uh, a yep. little bit. It picked up a little bit, I felt like, this the last two episodes. Sure. So I'm having better hopes for the next two. So uh, next week we will cover uh, episodes five and six for Happily Ever, Ever After season one. Yep. All, All right. right. We'll see everybody then. Okay. Until then. Okay. Okay. Right, bye. bye.